I'm David Hunt and welcome to The Art Hunter. My guest today, oh, it's so hard to describe what, what he does, but I'm going to give it a go. He calls it public sculpture. Now, what does that mean? Well, well, we'll get there eventually. He's an artist, a producer, a lecturer, an academic. Uh, he's a multidisciplined artist, uh, and um, that's an understatement because it's really out there, and I can't wait for you to hear some of the stuff he's got. He's mine. I love an artist's mine. He's also an illustrator of children's books, He's also involved with the, the City of Melbourne with their laneway public art that um, uh, he's involved in. We'll get to that a little bit later. And my guest today is Shane McGrath. Hello and welcome. Thank you, David. <laughs> Good to be here. Now, you know, like, your mind must just go crazy with um, your thought pattern and how you came up with your style of what you're doing here because it's so unique, it's so different. So let's start off, you know, like mm -hmm. what, where did your art come from? What, what, what was your influences to begin with? Oh, right at the beginning. Um, if you ask my mum, she'd say it was um, the way I ate my toast and used to bite it into, you know, horse shapes and things like that. But it was just kind of a, uh, an innate thing. It was kind of always there. Uh, I think maybe because I was quite a shy child and and things like write, confidence in my writing and stuff wasn't always there, that the vi visual communication was the thing that I tended to d depend on, particularly when everyone would say, oh, you're a very good drawer and yeah. all that sort of thing. Yeah. So uh, it started quite early, uh, but I didn't really kick into high gear, I don't think, until probably into my late 20s. I was kind of almost like a latecomer to uh, this shift that I would call towards my like uh, professional practice or my contemporary art practice because um, yeah it was it was always drawing and painting drawing and painting and then one day it just kind of switched and I started doing working with objects and working with film and yeah working with performance and collaborations so um, it's it's funny listen to the the uh, introduction it's very strange to hear myself described like that uh, and it's very flattering for you to um, say I've got a a wonderful mind. Well, you do because, and it will, will come out um, yeah. the, the more we talk. Sure. Now, you're in the middle of doing your PhD. That's right, in the final throes of it, yes. Uh, and I mean, so you're, is that a bit late for, for somebody, you know, like, because uh, it's usually people in their mid 20s, or is it often people in their, you know, like later 30s and stuff? It's, well, these days, I think it's a bit of a mix. It kind of okay. comes down to the, like, what's the terminal um, qualification that people are expected to have and back when I was thinking high school I think if you did your bachelor's uh, honours maybe was an option and then as time went on oh you've got to do your uh, do your master's and then you'll be able to make it in the, the art world or whatever field you want to go into and it was almost before my master's was complete that um, particularly when I came back to Australia from New Zealand uh, oh no you've got to have your PhD particularly if you wanted to work in education which I wanted to do and I I you was, like lecturing? I do. I, I, I was told that I, was, I would have made a good teacher when I was a lot younger, but I think when I balked that idea, it was more to do with how I saw my secondary school teachers and how, okay. as great as they were, they weren't appreciated by the students because art was always seen as like mm. this kind of bludge or this subject that you kind of rest before you get back to chemistry or, or whatever else it was. But do, do you think that's changing a lot now? Oh, I'd like to think so. I like to think so. It may have to do with how um, how the arts are perceived, or how a lot of artists are trying to change the perception of the role that art plays in everyone's life from day to day. Yeah. Uh, so I hadn't thought about uh, like university lecturing until I think I was midway through my midway through my masters, and I started you know doing a couple of classes. I was doing life drawing, and I was doing sculpture and painting classes, and then when I came back to Melbourne. It was a bit of a closed shop and I thought, well, I was told you probably need to do um, your doctorate if you wanted to further your career, no matter what part of the creative yeah. field you wanted to work yeah. in. Yeah. So am I old? Um, I kind of came to it a bit old, I think, but the, um, the candidates uh, are a real cross-section of, of ages. Um, I was studying with um, lecturers who'd been um, lecturers at university for decades and had been told you have to go back and 
and get your doctorate if you want to continue working here. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. So it's just okay. it's just how the whole that, that's moved. Yeah, how it's all but, shifted but it's, with everything nowadays. You know, like you've got to have a degree to do anything the, these days. It's uh, the, degree the, plus, degree plus, yep, and always extra, yep, extra. Yep. So. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of strange. I'm, I'm surrounded by um, guys I went to school with who, or people I knew at, at school, and they might have gone into the trades, or they became electricians and plumbers, and they make more than any of the other mm. artists I know. Mm. So uh, it's a, it's interesting how things kind of mm. shift. Now let's talk about this public sculpture yes. because th this is the thing that really fascinates mm -hmm. me about you. Um, where did the concept, where did the idea come from? And then we'll start talking sure. about individual ones. It was a, it was a natural kind of natural progression of uh, my practice because I think I was getting frustrated with painting and its limitations. And when I went to New Zealand at the age of, I think, like 27 or something, and I finally went to do my, um, finish my undergraduate studies, I was freed from all of these expectations of the sort of work I would make. And so I started doing 3D drawing and then I started doing installation. And, and it was at that time when like relational aesthetics was really on the rise. And I had a lot of really supportive um, lecturers who said, you don't have to limit yourself to one discipline. You might be studying painting, but you know, bring in objects, bring in performance. And as soon as I started to shift my way of thinking about what a discipline could be and how multidisciplinary practice became this term, I was like, well, I can do all of the things that I um, have, you know, skills or really have, have acquired over the years. I can include my filmmaking. I can include my performance, um, performance work, and my sense of humour as well. Because going back to study and, and making art was a very serious decision, and I was being very serious about it until one day I realised, oh, I can, I can have some fun with this. But the the problem is of what you're doing yeah. with, um, a, you know, like this performance yeah. stuff. Is that you're not going to make money out of it, you know, like because people that, keep saying that, yes. <laughs> and, and your wife, in particular, would be saying, "What are you doing to me? What are you doing to me?" Yeah, what is this that you make? It it is something that does come up, uh, and there's such like art and money is such a interesting conversation and complicated conversation. I think the way in which the art world and the way that which artwork is is commissioned by institutions, by councils, by all these like um, large financial institutions that, that normally would gravitate towards permanent objects or permanent you know, 2D works, they have a better understanding or a broader understanding of what art could be. And particularly these days, there seems to be a lot of a push towards engaging with the audience. Because let's be honest, there's a huge gap between the, let's just say the general public and the sort of artwork that they like and their skepticism or their suspicion of contemporary art and contemporary art world and all those people that occupy it, they don't recognise themselves or see themselves in that. Mm. So any opportunity where you can kind of overlap between, let's say, high art and like low art, um, I think is is viewed very um, uh, very positively by councils and, and funding bodies. And you just have to look at what gets shown at the uh, the NGV and all the triennials and particularly a lot of the, um, the larger... Um, uh, exhibitions uh, overseas. But not, you know, like the NGV, yes, they do a lot of stuff, but they, they're not doing anything really like you, unless they bring in the whole screens and yes. and you sit down and you experience yes. it, you know, like that's the only way you can do it. Yeah. But it, it would actually be on the ground, which would be so exciting and so wonderful. Yes. And I'm, you know, we're going to talk about two in particular. Sure. Um, they're over your shoulder. Yeah. Um, there's two guys leering over your head. You you can't actually tell it. I will but they're footballers. It. Yes, correct. they're footballers. Uh, this this is crazy stuff. You actually had the football jumpers made mm -hmm. in wool, like yeah. they used to be back in the 50s and yeah, 60s. Replicas, yep, yep. Um, so therefore, you had them specially made. So therefore, when they got wet and muddy, that 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 the, the heaviness of it. Yeah. You you know, like d tell us the whole you know like formula that you did here. Mm. You know, they they got on a bus. You know, went to the football match okay. together. Come on. You know, okay. Like, so yeah, you know, like but. Not, not the whole story. Not I won't. Story. I won't talk too long. Um, the the uh, concise um, version is, and this is a good example of saying about how how institutions have kind of changed their their um, uh, assumptions about what public art can be. So the Western Treatment Plant. So out at Werribee. Yep. So where they treat the water and the sewerage. Yep. You'd think that would be the last place that would 
commission public artworks. Like, never heard of it before. So that in itself was mm. an amazing mm. opportunity. And they asked us to respond to their history. And when we were shown their vast uh, facilities and these, all these um, open plains out at uh, Werribee, we were shown this now empty town of Cockerock, where a lot of the, f um, the workers and their families lived. Uh, but back in the day, this was um, covered in, in homes. They had a uh, general store. They had the community hall, swimming pool that was still there. But one of the few things that still um, survived was the football oval with posts and the change rooms. Yep. And I'd never heard of uh, Cockerock for starters, and I did, had no idea where this team came from. Yeah. And the more I asked, I realised they had very limited information. So I'm always attracted to um, ideas or, or looking for opportunities to respond to uh, a place, the significance of the place, usually the architecture of the place or some sort of um, built uh, structure. In this case, it was the oval and the pavilion. Uh, and the communities and the people that um, once lived there. Yep. And so I tried to look at the whole of the Western Treatment Plant and Cockerock through the filter of this uh, now gone, vanished football team. And there were still survivors, um, surviving you know, people who lived uh, on the farm, worked on the farm, had relatives that were from there. And I went on this long research detective work to try and track down How as long? much as I could. Our lead time actually wasn't as long as we would have liked, but I think it would have been approximately about six to eight months. Okay. Oh, I might have got that wrong, but approximately to that. Yeah. And I was just piecing together bits and you know, whatever I could find, I kind of respond to. So I had team, old team photos. What was the the um, the pattern of the of the of the um, the jumpers? They had the, the V on the chest. Great. What were the colours? We don't know. We've got to find the colours. And then, uh, of course, my my first idea is usually the, the most ambitious and normally, you know, cost prohibitive because my first thought was like, wouldn't it be great if we could stage a football match out here on this oval? That'd be, that'd, that'd be amazing. They'd, just to come around the corner and see that, that would be incredible. Of course, we can't afford it. So after I went in a big circle, I came back to that same idea. Uh, and we knew that the, the um, format was going to be um, uh, several um, artists making works in several locations. And the best way to um, have any influence on the audience experience or how they came upon the work was we put them all on a bus and we drove them to each site. So we knew they were going to be arriving and I wanted to um, have them all see the, the team at the same time. So we're in green and brown um, paddocks in the middle of a place that none of them have been before. And there's these red and white um, blotches running who, who around. Were, who was the audience? The audience were a real mix and this is kind of touching back on what I was saying before about those kind of very separate um, um, parts of an audience where you have the, the art crowd and you have the general public and we had um, art crowd from Melbourne and from interstate as well coming to see the work. We had locals coming out it they were curious about you know their town being activated because the most common question I got was when I was, when I was asking mm. about the work was why do you Why want to know you, about the yeah. about Cocker Rock and the team? I'm like, well, I'm, I want to respond to the site. They're like, oh, okay. Well, you've got to talk to so and so. Um, and that would have been fascinating in itself, wouldn't it? You know, like, it um, is. you know, being, you know, somebody telling you, well, you should talk to that person. You should, yeah. You know, like, and and that's the way history often is told when yeah. when it's been lost, written or lost. Yeah, because quite often it's like, oh, if you were asking six months ago, so and so. You could have asked, but they've since passed away. Yep, and, you know, yep. So all of these stories, and particularly like the non-glamorous stories, the, the, the idea of a football team in the, um, that survived up until 1964 in a, a town which, or a part of Melbourne, which is such an important location. This uh, changed Melbourne completely once we put the, the sanitation in. Mm. Uh, but it wiped a whole little you know, community out. Per se. Well, well, that, that they were built up because Melbourne was overrun with with sewerage and, mm. and waterborne diseases mm. until we built this at the time state of the art um, treatment facility out in Werribee, and it was out of sight, out of mind. Yep. But this, these were very important people. Yep. But um, they weren't really celebrated, and people wouldn't normally think that they would be. Anyway, mm. I just was fascinated by yep. these this, these ordinary people doing this extraordinary thing mm. and it was going to be lost in lost to time and mm. I just wanted to find a way to respond mm. to it in a way that an audience no matter where they came from they could all understand what the work was mm. and that's why I end up using football as this mm. this um, filter to to make the work through so all of a sudden 
the audience was arriving on yes. the bus. The footballers are out on the field. Out in the field, they're all warming up and playing, and the bus pulls up outside the pavilion, which has the red and white crepe paper streamers on yeah. it, as they used to do. Yeah. And most of the audience um, told me afterwards they expected them to watch this game unfold. Uh-huh. But instead, they all got together in a group and then rushed off the field, normally pushed through the crowd who'd gathered out front of the pavilion, yeah. into the, the home rooms, kick people out if they'd wandered in, then slam the doors on them, and the audience was left outside. <laughs> what? what? I don't get this. I don't get it. It all, it all stemmed from, in my research about Werribee, about Cockerock, about this place, this theme of the outsider came yeah. up, and the stigma of place kept coming up. Uh, and if you were from Werribee, people made all these assumptions about you. Even back in the day when they lived there, the team was called the shit stirrers by the, the opposition. They were called the, the, the um, Cockerock or the Met- Metropolitan Farm Herefords, yeah. named after the Hereford cows that they um, actually had out there. Yeah. Uh, but all this, this, uh, this theme of stigma and being an outsider, so I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we got the audience to come all the way out to, to Werribee, get on a bus, drive into Cockerock through these security fences, and then see this work with the expectation it was going to play out one way and then just pull the, the rug out from under them and shut them out of the work. So they didn't hear the coach in the room they or they, he- they could hear it? That's where the work shifted. So it went from being a visual performance to a, um, uh, an audio piece. But they would filter into the visitors' rooms, which also smelt of Denka Rub and all the other, um, the olfactics like that. Yep. You know. um, and they listened to the coach's address, which was just like any other sort of like, you know, suburban coach given the big yep. and address yep. to the team, except all of the dialogue was based on all the anecdotes and the stories that I'd heard or researched ah. about. So it was about people that were on the, originally on the team, about the, um, them being mistreated or kind of looked down on by the other players. So the, the coach would, the one that sticks in my mind, they come out here on their fancy bus, looking down on us, calling us the shit service and stuff. So, the idea was to then, whether the audience realised it or not, they'd wandered into the visitors' rooms and then were cast in the role of the visitors, uh-huh. of the outsiders. Yep, yep, and yep. the best um, uh, reaction I got from someone afterwards was that as the they all got riled up, like, you know, Herefords, Herefords. She said, I was terrified I was going to be forced to go out onto the Oval and play football <laughs> against them. I'm like, that is the best thing I've ever heard. Um, but, of course, another pulling of the rug was as soon as it built up to this crescendo, they just would go silent and then they would hear a burp burp of the bus outside, which they had been told was their signal to, to go back to the bus. And so when, just when they thought it was going to uh, reach this crescendo, it just stopped and they had to leave. So the whole thing is over in about seven minutes. Wow. Beginning to end, yeah. Wow. So all that time and effort, having the football jumpers made, setting up the Everything. team everything for seven minutes yep. and how well did you document it? We filmed it uh, extensively, we photographed it extensively. Uh, I knew that I was going to exhibit the artifacts and the objects right down to the, um, the, uh, the souvenir stubby holders that were given out to audience by the umpires, the goal umpires came oh, wow. and met them at the bus and yeah. were handing them these stubby holders which had the the team emblem, which yeah. I had to track down, that was almost that almost disappeared. The, the, the day's date of the um, of the event and all the other information, and it had the lyrics of the the team song, oh. which was lost until about I think two weeks before the actual event. Yeah, we didn't know what the song was or yeah. what the lyrics were, but I managed to track it down at the eleventh hour. Someone called, oh, "I heard you're making this." Thing. I'm like, "My brother and I, we wrote the lyrics." I'm like, "Great, fantastic." And then as they got back on the bus the music would come up and the team song started playing. And they all had, and to they sing all it. had the lyrics. Oh, fantastic. And they even had some, uh, a case where one of the old um, ex-players was on the bus and there's footage of him like singing along. <laughs> and then they drove off to the next, to the oh, next work. Oh, wow. So we filmed it and, and photographed it and documented it extensively. Um, but when I made a film for exhibition, I deliberately didn't include the uh, audio for Why? The Why? The, it was performed... Uh, I can't remember how many times we actually performed it over the, the, the two weekends. It was at least a dozen times. And the, um, the team would come out and they would perform for seven minutes and they'd go away for two hours and they'd come back and they'd perform for seven minutes and do it over and over and over again. And because it was such, um, a, 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 such a temporal work, it existed for this such a short amount of time for this little snippet and it was such um, an uh, experiential work. So mm. 
I could explain to you what happened. We could probably show you footage and, 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 and such, but you won't know what it was like. You couldn't smell the, the oh, tanker okay. rope. So, you oh, couldn't, okay. You couldn't, yep. you couldn't make you these decisions about, I'm going to wander into the visitors' rooms myself. So the, the audio for the film yep. is just the sound of the crepe paper blowing outside, which was a constant sound because the wind is always right. blowing across. Yep. A, a yep. bit of a stink as well. Yeah. <laughs> always blowing across. And so I wanted it to be a standalone work. Yeah. Um, but the coach's address did get put into a, uh, the recording of it was part of a small sculptural work I made post-performance. Yeah. Whereas when you walk past it in the gallery, it would, would. trigger it and you'd hear the speech right. from inside. So, so there was a, an exhibition of it, per the, se, I think well. the, there's an image. Yep. That's the one there. That was at, at um, the Incinerator Gallery in uh, Mooney Ponds. Right, um, okay. Now, what was the reaction uh, to the audience, uh, from the audience? Yeah. Um, how did they react? It, it was a real mixed audience, almost exclusively um, positive. Um, my dad, who's a bit old school, and he's always he's always like, "When are you going to do your painting? When, 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 when are you going to be when famous? Are gonna, when are you going to do your art? Get back to your art. Like like the painting is the thing he understands. He's always um, been a bit perplexed and confused by my performance work and my public sculpture work. Um, but this was the first time I think that he could tap into exactly what the work was about, and he understood okay. what it was. Okay. He was actually one of the goal umpires. Right. Okay. My brothers, my cousins, my mates—they were all part of the, all the performers. Yeah. And he was the goal umpire, and he had a long history in football. And that's something he'd always, whenever he's like giving you like a life lesson, he'd always compare it back to football. Like oh. The training and yep. the playing yep. and the yep. difference, you know. And he saw the, the reaction from the audience, and he saw how no matter where they came from, they all were able to understand the work. Mm. Uh, if, if not a superficial level, they understood mm. um, the heart of the work. Yeah. But what about the people that you got the grant from? You know, like, how did they react to it? You they know, loved was, it. They it was absolutely positive? loved it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were so excited that I was able to track down and reactivate their history. Yep. Um, they desperately wanted a, um, a, a jumper, which um, I th I'm very com I'm sure we gave them a jumper. Um, <laughs> oh, you, you'd, you'd hope so. Jump. Um, these jumpers were made on the same machines that used to make the VFL jumpers back in the day. Wow. Like they were collecting um, dust and then just happened to be reactivated for an AFL project. Yeah. And I was able to slip an order in and have these merino wool wow. replicas. They would have, wow. almost exactly how they would have been yeah. made. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, they loved all of the, the, um, uh, all the photographs and the anecdotes and the stories I was able to, to, um, to collect together because that was like anybody, you're so pleased and proud of your history if someone else takes mm. interest in it. Mm. Well, not just because, but... Oh, no, but I, I think taking it beyond that, mm. you know, like for, for me, yeah. I, I would love it. And, mm. you know, and, and the fact that you were shutting, uh, you know, like the audience out a little mm. bit and, and then, you know, stopping it at that moment and then taking, you know, like it, it was so clever of you, Thank what, you. What, what, what you did there. All right, we're going to jump to another yes. one of them, yes. um, and this is the one that I, that that one was pretty crazy. But this one is uh, amazing for the city of Moorabbin. Yes, well, it used to be Moorabbin, but now the city of Kingston. They, right, okay. they kind of amalgamated um, a number of uh, uh, um, number of councils. Yep. This is also with the same curators. So um, David Cross, uh, Professor David Cross, and Dr. Cameron Bishop were the two curators for. Um, uh, treatment, yep. which was the football yep. um, project, and on the back of that, or the success of that, I think caught the eye of the uh, Kingston Council, and they asked us to, or asked the curators to respond to moments in their own history. Yeah, and um, the curators decided to frame it around several, a bracket of several years from the late seventies into early eighties. Uh -huh. And I had nineteen eighty one, and nineteen eighty one was the year that um, Rick Springfield. Uh, wrote and released uh, his uh, award-winning single, Jesse's Girl. The thing that but, basically broke him in the States. But how, how did you relate it to that area? You well, know, we, like, well, but a lot of people don't realise he actually is Australian. And yeah, his uh, well, parents, I think, yeah. You know, of, of certain, zoot. I know, we know. Zoot. Of course, of course, of course. Pink Zoot. I know. Like, <laughs> you tell people about Zoot and all the other bands at the time, they may not, may not realise. It's the same thing, people don't realised that ACDC um, is an American in America, but they all thought that he was uh, American. But his parents had a, their last house that they lived in was in uh, Parkdale, in uh, just within the the the, um, the umbrella of Kingston. Mm -hmm. And so again, just like the football 
concept. Wouldn't it be great if we could, you know, put on a football match? When we found out about the house, which um, only happened because it was coming up for sale, it was sadly after um, uh, Rick's uh, mother's passing that it went on the market and that was used as like a, a selling device, like this, you know, the house where Rick Springfield grew up. Mm. As usual, that was not exactly accurate. But uh, again, the first idea, wouldn't it be hilarious if we had like a parade, like a second line parade down the street singing Jesse's Girl? Yeah. And we finish out the front of his house. Yeah. That would be great. Of course, we can't do that because that's going to require, you know, uh, at least 100 people. Um, turned out to be more like 200 and f- something, 200, 300 people. Uh, but we just couldn't let it go. It was just too funny. And it was, um, again, it was celebrating or, or basically putting a, micro- a mi- um, microphone putting a, um, uh, a, a microscope on the most unexpected part of like outer Melbourne suburbs and we're celebrating this place. And you walk around there any other time of day and there's like these orange brick buildings and these, you know, all these, it all seems very bland. Yep. You drive through it on the way to get to somewhere nice. Yep. Um, and apologies to, to um, Kingston. <laughs> but um, uh, there was a big um, push for us to be involved directly with the community. Yep. And that's kind of my thing. It's like, okay, I'm going to work with them, but in a way that is going to be exciting and it's not going to be um, condescending, which is one of the biggest issues I have with some uh, community uh, practices. I agree. Yeah, I it's agree. like, oh, isn't this nice? We'll go here and we'll do, we'll yeah, do a painting together and yeah. then we'll say we did it and mm. isn't that nice? And we're mm. ticking certain boxes. Mine was, okay, I'll, I'm just like the, the, the football players who were not artists, they had never done it, made artwork in their life, and yet there they were. There's a level of authenticity which you cannot replicate. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna reach out to uh, local community, amateur musical groups, anyone that wants to be involved, and we're gonna make this work together. And in the end, it was um, Parkdale Secondary College. Uh, they had um, a great kind of brass section. I knew, okay, we're gonna have a, a second line, a bit like a New Orleans version, Fantastic. Let them come up with their, their yep. um, arrangement. Yep. Uh, the, uh, um, the pop choir, Moorabbin Mordialic Pop Choir, made up of people who just want to get out and sing, and they get together once yep. a week and just sing pop songs, and like, yeah, we can't, we can't wait. The, uh, the Long Beach Ukulele Band, so Jesse's Girl on Ukuleles. <laughs> and the, uh, and the Filipino, uh, Filipino Seniors Society down there. So. Uh, and they just would get together at, um, in their church hall and they would have dinner, they'd cook food together and they would sing karaoke and they just loved being with each other yeah. and singing was yeah. kind of central to that. And so the whole thing was built on the back of these, these uh, community groups. And the only thing we knew that was going to happen was we're all going to march down the street behind this handmade banner, um, the banner which is also... Uh, aesthetically based on the uh, the spray painted Jesse's girl on the brick wall at the ah, start of the video clip. Ah, yeah. right, yeah. And uh, they'd all march down the street with the audience who've joined them, and then. And who t- was that audience? It was again. That was uh, a real mixed bag. The same format. They were all going to meet at one place. In this case, it was the um, uh, Moorabbin Town Hall. Yep. Everyone gets a ticket, yep. and they get on the bus, and the bus would drive them to um, six places, hence six moments in Kingston. Uh-huh. And, uh, and they, dro- they drove to um, as close as they could on the, on the bus, where they were met by myself with the banner and some other um, performers with uh, the uh, Bull Terriers, the Bull Terrier being um, the dog that appeared on the front of um, Rick Springfield's album, Working Class Dog. Yep. And then we walked them down to the street where the band joined them and the music piped up so they were virtually part of the parade they were part of the parade they were they were even given like a low like brick banner we asked for two volunteers and they held that at the front yeah and they joined um, from um, from behind so their perspective was actually the for most of the performance was actually the back of the the bands or the performers heads and the back of the banner so this image that you see here that's what you see if you run around the front to get a photo or uh-huh. that's how the the documentation would record it but yep. for them they were part of the they were part of the parade. Yeah. And there was singing and there was dancing and, all, you know, you never know what was going to happen. And then we timed it so just as the guitar solo came in, we've reached the front of the house and there on a flatbed truck is our Rick Springfield with the 80s hair and the, the, his outfit was mimicking the outfit from the video clip as well. And he's there playing the guitar solo on the back of the, 
of the back of the truck. And then we all finished the song together and we were at the front and then the song ends and everyone yay, applauding and clapping. And then they all get ushered back onto the bus again, which is waiting for them around the block. So again, that lasted for about, again, maybe about seven or eight minutes or something too. So it was, uh, yeah, it was probably, as someone said, it was the most joyous and like, uh, like unbridled happiness the experience of being part of the the work. So it would have been a couple of um, situations as in you know feeling that joy. So sure. it would have been all the performers, all, all those people were that all came together yep. and, and that moment of yep. it all all happening, and then the reaction from the 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 audience yep. and the audience experience being blown away by something. So it would have come from many angles. Mold, and what absolutely. what was what was your reaction like? Or were you too tense or you know, like, did you, were you taking it in? Were you actually feeling the vibe from everyone? I, I was carrying the, the banner for yep. every single uh, parade. And yep. we did, I think, 17 or 18 of them. It was over two weekends. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. It wasn't just one time. No, no, no. It was... It was multi- so each, each, um, each day, it was a, 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 um, the band would change. Okay. So the first day was the secondary college, uh-huh. and they performed that, um, I think we did that four or five times. Uh, the second day was the uh, Filipino seniors. Yep. So they've got their zimmers and and people walking down with walking sticks. We've got the the speaker on on wheels. Yeah. And, and the um, uh, singing the karaoke through the through the uh, through the speaker. The third week uh, was the ukulele band. I yep. think. Yeah. I may have got the order mixed up. Yeah. But the last one was the pop choir. Now that one was um, my experience of it was. Every single performance is going to be different. Yep. We have people of different levels of ability, uh, musically, vocally. It didn't matter because the, the, the sh- they were loving it. They were actually the work. The performers were the, were the central part of it. I'm, I'm there as like a, I'm making it happen. I'm managing, I'm producing, I'm setting the wheels in motion. But without them mm. performing it, there is no work. Yep. And um, the last one... It all kind of came to uh, this amazing realization. The last day, we were threatened by weather, ah. and we thought we're going to get rained out. Yep. And the pop choir was made of about 50, 60 performers, and I thought I need to find an alternative location. So this is like months build up, and I've got two days, three days to find a potential different location. And because of the significance of the house, which Rick never lived in, his parents lived there Mm. he may have come back during his early years when he was having some issues Mm. before he went off to the states he was in the states 10 years before he wrote jesse's girl Mm. so the idea of of saying this is um rick springfield's boyhood home was a big fib Mm. but people didn't seem to care yeah but it was actually a very important central place for Mm. him Mm. so much so that when we reached out to him he's like listen we're happy for you to go ahead with it but um, rick doesn't want to be involved directly because um the sad memories associated with his mum. It was of course. still very, very new yeah. for him. But I knew his mother was a, was a very um, big um, or important um, parishioner, part of the congregation, the local uh, church. And so I actually was able to track down through his biography, trying to guess where it was. It, it's the church where he got married to his wife, Barbara. Okay. The house was where they had the reception following mm. the wedding. There's photos of the two of them with like a, a duffel bag or something over their shoulder. They're laughing as they're leaving the house. So the house was very important for him, but not for very, very different reasons, mm. and the church as well. So I actually managed to track down the church, and they were so generous. Uh, they had actually converted the inside of the church. They'd taken out all the pews and made it like a, a, a community space. And the idea of an art performance that had something to do with one of their parishioners, they loved the idea. Mm. And so the whole location changed. The bus got diverted on the last okay. performance, yep. and they were brought into the church where... It seemed to be this perfect location for this choir up on the steps mm, of the altar mm. performing Jesse's Girl. And as the audience got walked in, they were like, what the, what the hell is going on? <laughs> this, is a, this is incredible. And I actually got quite emotional um, on that day because I uh, found out on my first visit that there were um, stained glass windows dedicated to both Rick's father and mother. Whoa. In the, that he 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 and the family had organised to put up there, and talk about full circle. Jesse's girl was written about a couple 
about this guy, Jesse, and his girlfriend, who Rick had met when he thought he'd given up on music. He thought, I'll try a different career. And in LA, he went to do a um, stained glass window workshop. And that's where he met this couple, wrote a song about them. Yeah. And then here we are all this time later in this church with these stained glass windows dedicated to his parents. Mm. And it's just kind of hit me on this day yeah. that I was explaining it. And I started getting emotional. Yeah. I was probably quite tired, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, it was... Um, it affected, it affected us all in very uh, different ways, but I don't know of anyone, maybe they're being polite, but I don't think anyone came away from that thinking like, oh, I'm not sure how I feel about it. Mm. They tended to really be, you know. But what, what about um, the locals? You know, like if you were doing it every weekend, yep. were they starting to hang out the front of their houses? Yes, yes. There actually was a really lovely moment that no one else really saw, I don't think. Um, when we had to do the letter drop and introduce ourselves, saying we'd like to do this project. Right. And a couple of doors down, there was um, a family who turns out the, um, I won't say the lady's name, but she was very good friends still with Rick and they kept in touch. Okay. It turns out they used to keep an eye on um, his mum, oh, which right. was living by herself. Yep. And it was actually her husband that uh, uh, found her when she'd passed away oh. putting the laundry out. Wow. And she was lying on the grass outside. Right. Yep. And they were very protective of the idea because they thought that maybe, as you know, everyone's suspicious, was I trying to, to take the piss? Take the piss, you yeah. know? And I said, no, 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 we're here to celebrate yep. um, this this song, which is still like one of the most um, popular songs that's played on like mm. gold one of, you know, every single day. It's on rotation. And no one around the world. Exactly. You know, like, and especially in America. Exactly. You know, like where he was very big. Exactly. And so uh, as soon as they realized that we weren't taking the mickey, they would come out and they'd, they'd, they'd come, and the kids would come out and they're right on their bikes going down the street watching what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> and then one day, one day I saw they had this moment where this um, uh, young um, uh, family, young Chinese family who'd moved into the house and they were very supportive. They, were, like, they couldn't believe that their house was famous, according to us. Uh, they were relatively new to the area and I don't know if they knew their neighbours. And then one after one of the performances, as all the audience was walking away and the band was all like on a high and, you know, laughing and heading back to, you know, our artist area, um, some of the neighbours came down and started introducing themselves and they had little kids as well and, and this lovely little moment. I'm like, no one's going to see this. And this was actually such a beautiful little moment mm. that only came about because of the artwork. Yeah. So that's this, these moments, these, um, this, this authenticity that comes out with this type of work, yeah. uh, working with artists and non-artists, um, that's what brings me back to this sort of work. So you may not make a lot of money from it, but the, the type of work that comes out of it is very satisfying. Do you know what? And I've been thinking this for a while um, about what you do. I can't believe that somebody hasn't latched onto you and like, you know, like you're, you're doing something, you know, like major here through the city of Melbourne or going to Adelaide for the arts festival in Adelaide or... Me too, I can't know. believe it. No, it's, it's, it's a strange you know, like thing. How, how do you, how, you, you almost got to go out there and promote yourself. Or, or oh, you as, as you said, you know, like it was the, the same people that were organising the two, two events yes. that, that got you involved yeah. in uh, the second one. But... You know, like it, it's th this is really interesting art. You know, like Thank that you. that people would love to embrace, mm. and I, 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 I can see that the, uh, it could be a major event. What you know, what what are you thinking next? I'm, are I, you thinking I totally big? agree with you. I'm like I'm always trying to find ways uh, to well, for that to happen, of course, and I and I agree. I agree with you, particularly. Um, this important area of dispelling the suspicion that a lot of people have of contemporary practice, contemporary art. They think it's not for them. Not in realising that once upon a time that art was completely imbued in everyone's lives. Mm. In every, and then they didn't separate themselves from it. But as soon as it gets put on a pedestal, yep. then it's out of my reach and that's mm. for someone else. Or, unfortunately, these days, it's, um, it's a luxury that yeah. uh, my 
taxpayers' dollars shouldn't be spending, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Salvador Dali was doing it. You know, yeah. remember he walked around in the bull ring, you know, like, and had all these people, you know, like, following him. And Absolutely. He, and he had, you know, like, all, all this extraordinary th- little bits and p- it, it, people have always yeah. done it. Oh yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but it's. Um, but it's now that we need this, and and you are like, and it's your imagination that's coming up with it, that's making people think. Ah, I, I think also too the um, the isolation we've all been living through with COVID has also highlighted how important these exchanges that we have, and they're not permanent. The 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 artwork that I make isn't uh, marble and bronze forever up on the mm. pedestal. Yeah. But it, it doesn't mean it's any less valuable because uh, when people would talk about artwork that they see and that moves them, they talk about the emotions. They mm. talk about mm. this, this, this memory that's forever in their mind mm. when I stood in front of when I experienced this. Mm. And so there's no reason why it can't happen with this work. Mm. As far as my profile in Australia, I, I, I kind of put it down to me being away for a very important period in my practice. So I left Melbourne to go to New Zealand and I was there for what I thought was going to be one or two years and was seven. New Zealand is very um, uh, supportive of its of its art and its artists and even though Melbourne is like a, sorry Melbourne, Wellington is a very small Melbourne and it's a very small pool, it's a very supportive mm. um, network there mm. and I actually was starting to make what I think was some great inroads, yep. like I had actually some large public commissions and getting involved in a lot of shows but um, I had to eventually come back. When I came back, because I'd been absent for all of this period where you normally create these networks that propel you into this career, you came back and I quickly found out that no one knew or cared who I was. Mm. I'm like, oh, we've got to start again. Yeah. So that's what I've been, I guess, been doing. doing. Uh, because we bring in people from overseas to do similar things. Sure. Uh, and you know, like, and it's that whole thing. Oh, you know, like, they must be important. They're from France or you know, like South America. Or, perceptions. It's, uh, perceptions. it's perception. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like you, you've got to keep on working towards it. So, what are yeah. you doing with the the city of um, Melbourne? Okay, the city of Melbourne. It's a, a bit of an embargo on it at the moment. But at the moment, under the um, the uh, title of Creative Laneways, it's a. Uh, you may have actually seen it on the the news. I think it was end of last year beginning of this year uh, at its core it's actually an employment program so city of Melbourne state government uh, trying to help artists get back to work but m- the main thing is to get people back into the city mm. because the city is just emptied out uh, absolutely it's so sad yeah yeah and uh, after having a prolonged period working from home or yep. moving into state or such getting people back into the city is a lot harder than people expected they already assumed it was going to be hard mm. So I can't talk, talk too much about it, but it, it is this big initiative to bring the arts back into the centre of Melbourne uh, and with it, the people, with it, the audiences. Uh, and is it something as ambitious as the two, two things we've spoken about? Today? Oh, I, I, I'm more so. More, oh. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm there in the, uh, the capacity of a producer. Right. But we're working with many um, um, uh, fantastic and exciting young artists uh, but I can't say too much more about it. But it's going to be a real performance art stuff, though. It's 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 a, it's a street art, art in the street, in the laneways, in lots of different um, guises. I wouldn't go as far as saying it. It's as performative as such. Two uh, D, three D, um, light works. But I I can't say anything more okay. about that. But yeah. there's um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be exciting. But it's very ambitious, citywide, mm. citywide from. Spring to Spencer. Right, fantastic. Yeah. Now, just quickly, mm. um, illustrating for children's yeah. books. Um, oh, a smile, a real little <laughs> smile came on your face when, when I, I mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about and, and have you done much of that? It's a, it came out of necessity like anything else working in the arts. Okay. You, know, if you have to be able to put your hand to many, many things. And like I said, I started out doing drawing and painting from a very young age. And, uh, you know, my parents, you know, bless them, they were always worried about my career and when it came to like doing a work experience, they're like, what about uh, being an architect? Architects, you know, make, make lots of money, don't they? And if you ask my wife who's an um, interior architect, she would say no, no, not as much as they should no. or you think. But uh, it just was a case of picking up freelance work. So okay. I just started illustrating, um, doing kind of cartoony work and it was actually, it took off when I went to New Zealand and I was working for 
of the education wing of the New Zealand um, like publishing um, uh, house. So learning media. So mm. they're the sorts of books that would always turn up in schools. Okay. And so I'd be given stories to uh, to illustrate historical stories, you know, in um, uh, Maori stories. Learning how to negotiate or work with uh, uh, Maori writers and um, a lot of the visual um, frameworks they have to work within, we can and can't do. And it was when I came back to Australia, I think I just started reaching out to publishing houses, and I've, I've published. Oh, God. For uh, Big Sky Publishing up in Sydney, mainly the Australian stories, uh, about half a dozen or more books. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been great. Um, a lot of, uh, like, Shearing Time and Granny's Place and a lot of these stories which I, that I get really drawn to. Yeah. Because I, I tend to tap into a lot of my memories of visiting family in, yeah. in rural Victoria and um, did a book about the thylacine down in Tasmania. Uh, um, uh, Dreaming Soldiers, which is about um, a story set in South Australia about a young Indigenous boy and his um, and his friend who um, grow up together and end up going off to serve in the First World War together. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was an amazing um, work. We actually won a prize for that one. So you illustrate and somebody else writes the story. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea is to get it. I've got plenty of stories that I, uh, I've uh, written that I want to illustrate myself. Uh -huh. Just haven't got around to, to doing that yet, but... Um, well, why not? You'd see I know. doing Good nothing. <laughs> Good. Oh, damn it, you're right. Um, the, uh, that's always the plan. That's always the plan. And now that my wife and I are expecting uh, very soon. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, that's what she sends her apologies, otherwise she'd be here today. Um, uh, I had a thought just, I think, yesterday. I'm like, I've got to start writing and illustrating these books for um, the new Bubba. So. Exactly. Yeah. You've yeah. got to produce one. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and it's got to be a performance when you hand it to... <laughs> That's right. Oh, gonna, yeah. did you say her? People. Did you say her? Yes, it is a her. her. Yeah. Um, uh, on her first birthday, then one on the second birthday. Oh, and yeah. then she'll go, oh, Dad, don't. It's you're like, embarrassing exactly. me. Exactly. <laughs> so daggy. Don't all kids at school have their own books published about them? Anyway, because <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll likely be about her as well. So yeah. uh, the, the illustrating I... I I love, but like any other creative industry, it's one of those ones where uh, until you really make it, um, going full time is is a bit of a, mm. a bit of a leap for um, most artists, particularly now. So, mm. uh, multidisciplinary. That's what I do. Yep, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for chatting to us today. It was uh, wonderful, and keep on doing what you're doing because oh, yeah. I love what you're doing. Thank you so much. In the show, I'm sure we'll. Um, shoot me to new heights I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks for watching, I'm David Hunt and you've been watching The Art Hunter.